Hello, in this video we're going to look at what are called compiler intrinsic functions. Sometimes they're just called intrinsics, uh, sometimes they're called compiler intrinsics, it depends on who you're talking to. But the basic premise is this, that there exists a set of functions that the uh, C and C++ compiler can use to more or less program directly in assembly language. Uh, and the reason they're wrapped in functions is the compiler can go ahead and perform optimizations on these intrinsic functions. So in a way, I guess, uh, it's useful to use intrinsic functions because we're really sort of manipulating the processor at a very low level, but we can rely on the compiler to help us out where necessary. They're a good go-between between, between full-on assembly language and C and C++ code. When you talk with somebody about intrinsic functions, usually they are referring to the extended feature sets of your processor. Now, my last video was about optimizing the processing of a Mandelbrot fractal, and it's probably worth watching some of that video to understand uh, the second half of this video, at least to put it into some context, because I pulled in a load of intrinsic code that I'd written uh, to prove a point about parallelism, and I said, well, if anybody's interested in how I got to this code, uh, I will make a separate video about it, and this is that video. But before we dive into specifically the Mandelbrot calculation code, uh, I'm just going to give a very brief and simplistic overview of intrinsics. We did cover this slightly in the last video, but I feel to make this a complete video, uh, I'll include a little bit more about how they get set up and how they're implemented. But before we do, I just want to show a little demonstration of how the compiler itself is actually pretty good at using intrinsics without being told to use them. Here I have a very simple program, and I create three reasonably large arrays, each containing 16,384 floating point elements. The first thing my program will do is initialize uh, each of these arrays to a constant value. The second thing it'll do is then add array1 to array2 and write the result in array3. And finally, because people write in and complain, I'm deleting the arrays. In the properties for this project, I'm going to explicitly set the Enabled Enhanced Instruction Set option to No Enhanced Instructions. I don't want it to sort of exploit any of the additional processing capabilities of the processor. And I'm also then going to go and compile in debug mode. And I'm going to instruct Visual Studio, because we're in debug mode, to run to the cursor. And the bit that I'm interested in is this calculation. Big Array 3 equals Big Array 1 plus Big Array 2. I've told it to show me the processor registers, and we can see the, the execution point has stopped at the location I required. Now, don't forget, we're in debug mode. And one of the things I want to look at in debug mode is if I go up here and go to Windows, I can look at the disassembly. Now, it might be quite confusing to look at disassembly uh, at this stage in the video, but it does highlight something quite interesting. If I scroll up a little bit, well, here we've got the assembly language for the uh, implementation of the for loop. And here, for this line beneath it, we've got the assembly language for calculating uh, the, well, the expression. And even though it looks horribly complicated, we can make some educated guesses at what's going on here. We're moving some values from memory into the processor. So here we're moving in a value from big array 1. And this is the floating point load command. Then we move in uh, data from big array 2, and we call the floating point add command. We then use the floating point store command to, well, write to big array 3. So it's a very simple uh, set of assembly instructions. I, I can see why assembly has a bit of a hard time, because when you look at this and you see all of these different registers and offsets, it can be quite confusing to look at. But we're not that interested. What we're interested in is these fundamental uh, mnemonics down here. Move, move, floating point load, move, move, floating point add, move, move, floating point store. And then we jump back round to the start of our for loop. Now, I've deliberately chosen to run this in debug mode, and it's not for the reason you might expect. But I'd also like to demonstrate why debug mode is a little bit different to release mode. In debug mode, we expect our program to behave in the particular semantic way we've implied with the code that we've written. I've just nipped out of the assembly language view so we can see our program. And what I was saying was it's important that the program behave the way we expect it to. So when I press F10 to step through the code, I'm going to be stepping through this 16,384 times. And the assembly reflects this. There's nothing particularly special going on here. We're just performing floating point load, floating point add, and floating point store. And then we jump back around to the start of our loop. I'll stop the program, but now I want to run it in release mode. And I'm going to run to the same point with a breakpoint. Now you might think, oh, hang on, you can't use breakpoints in release mode. Actually, you can. Uh, it's just you've got to be aware of what's going on when you do. 
So here I am uh, in release mode at the correct location and now I'm going to look at the disassembly for it. And we can see our for loop up here. There's a bit more stuff involved in our for loop now. Uh, but here we've got the fundamental expression we're interested in. And what we see it doing is floating point load, add, store, load, add, store, load, add, store, load, add, store. And it's doing this over and over again. It's unrolled it. So now one iteration through our loop no longer corresponds to one sequence of loading, adding, and storing. The compiler has recognized that actually what we're doing here can be performed faster by sequentially using these instructions. So every iteration of our loop no longer corresponds to the increment of just one single element. The compiler has made some decisions for us here and it's optimized the code appropriately. It's doing uh, eight additions per loop. And I think that's quite a clever thing. The compiler has looked, all we're doing is adding together two arrays. I can really optimize this. And it will have chosen to do it like this because, well, processes are actually a lot more complicated than we give them credit for. The last thing we want to do is sort of stall the information going into them. So it knows that by keeping this particular part of the processor nice and active, uh, we can get the most speed out of it. Whereas in debug mode, well, we were unnecessarily branching in and out of our loop. The point I'm trying to make here is that the compiler will often make decisions for us, uh, which it thinks are better in a given scenario. And this is why there is some truth when people say that you can't really outsmart the compiler. It knows better than you do. And that's getting very, very true these days. But what we'll demonstrate in this video is there are situations that it simply can't. It doesn't have a large enough view or a broad enough view of the entire problem in order to make a sensible decision about how to optimize it. So we'll come back to all of this in a minute. In the fractal video, the objective was to number crunch as much as possible, and we managed to render quite a, a high resolution Mandelbrot to a great level of depth by abusing parallelism available on your computer. Not only did we use lots of threads and a thread pool, we also used what's known as vector processing, and accessing the vector processing components of your CPU requires intrinsic functions. Now, I apologize for a little bit of repetition here from the fractal video, but it makes a good point. Inside your central processing unit, you have something called an arithmetic logic unit, an ALU. It's the thing that does the stuff. It's the maths. It takes in an input. It might take in a bunch of inputs. And it takes in an operation and hopefully gives us a result. It's the silicon part of your chip that can do the plus, minus, multiply, divide and other things too. Your processor has additional processing instruction sets beyond the uh, simple ALU we're looking at here. In fact, the code we've just shown in the disassembly view was using just the basic ALU. These additional instruction sets can allow us to process more inputs simultaneously, but there's a catch. Even though the enhanced instruction sets are effectively like having additional ALUs on your CPU, and again, these can take in inputs, and produce results, they can't have unique operations. The operation specified is applied to all of the ALUs simultaneously. And this gives way to what is known as SIMD. Single instruction, multiple data. So all of the data's going into these ALU components are unique and wonderful, but the instruction that they're all operating is the same. So single instruction, but working on multiple data. And so the next natural question to ask is, well, how many of these ALU cores, in quotations, uh, are available to us? Well, if we first look at a slightly older technology, SSE, which was a streaming SIMD extension or SIMD streaming extension, I can never remember. These provided a special register which held 128 bits. And the nature of these bits was customizable. For example, we could easily store inside this four 32-bit floats. We could also store four of the other 32-bit data types, such as integers. If we're working with, say, a 64-bit double, we can store two of those and we can even have uh, more fine grain parallelism too. We could store, for example, eight 16-bit values, such as short integers. Therefore, it's not directly possible to say there are a specific number of additional ALU cores. It really depends on how these registers are structured. And taking this first line as an example, it would allow us to operate on four floating point values simultaneously. But the operation would need to be the same for all of those values.
For various business, political and legal reasons, uh, SSE stopped growing in size and eventually a new technology called AVX came out. And currently, most processors will ship with AVX2, not all of them, and this is one of the problems with intrinsics. Even though you think you might have bought the most fantastic WYSI processor you can afford, it's always worth checking its feature set on the datasheet before you buy it. It's not always about clock cycle, so different processor models will have different feature sets available. And some of the more budget processors, for example, won't support this feature set. But in principle, the only real difference between AVX2 and SSE is that the registers are now 256 bits wide. Which, of course, allows us to fit in eight floating point 32-bit values, or four 64-bit uh, values. And it was this storage of four 64-bit doubles which I exploited to help me render the Mandelbrot fractal faster. The reason we need intrinsic functions to exist in the C++ language is, well, C and C++ has no way of really knowing how to uh, handle the maths between these types of registers, these extended registers. And that's because the language itself strives to be sort of implementation independent. So when we want to use and abuse these extended feature sets, the compiler needs to be aware that they exist because ultimately it's got to produce unique assembly code which can actually use these instructions because these instructions will be unique to the processor. They are not uh, a standard set of instructions in the x86 format. They are, they are an extension and therefore we need them to be defined somewhere. So compilers do need to be aware that these platforms exist. But the language itself doesn't really have any mechanism for expressing uh, the operating on eight simultaneous floating point values, for example. So we need to dip into the intrinsic functions uh, to allow us to do that. And as I'm about to demonstrate, uh, your C++ compiler is actually quite proficient at identifying that if it is allowed to use some of these extension sets, that it can in certain situations. I've come back to our very simple program again, and this time in the project properties, I'm going to enable uh, the application of AVX2, Advanced Vector Extensions 2. Here you can see the others, SSE, SSE2, and uh, even though my processor doesn't support it, the latest version of the Visual Studio compiler does support AVX512. I'll give you one guess if you can identify what the 512 really means. So I'll choose AVX2 and click Apply. And just as we did before, I'm going to run in debug mode and we'll have a look at the assembly that's produced. Here we've got our for loop, and as before, we don't really need to understand everything that we can see here. What we are interested in are these two instructions here. We've got vmovSS and vAddSS. These are the vector extension specific assembly language instructions. And we can see that it's moving uh, data into register XMM0. And if I put my cursor over XMM0, our array, don't forget, is a floating point array. So that's 32 uh, bit floats. And on the left here, I've pulled in the full 128-bit register for XMM0. And as I step through the code, well, it's only pulled in one value. So this is the hex for the entire register. So we could split that into four 32-bit values. But there's also something else strange going on here. I thought we chose AVX2. Why are we using these bog standard 128-bit registers. Where are my 256-bit ones? I've enabled them to be viewed down here and well something interesting is already visible. We can see that they're actually shared. That this XMM0 which is part of the SSE instruction set is the lower half of this YMM0 which is the new AVX2 256-bit register. Just to keep things a little bit clearer I'm going to get rid of this. There we go. But disappointingly, what we see is it's really only loaded in one value. So this is the hexadecimal equivalent of one floating point value. And if I put my cursor over the register, uh, I'll zoom in in the video, what we can see is that one of the elements has been set to 20. Well, that's kind of what we expected because we know that our big array 1 is filled with 20s and big array 2 is filled with 50s, and we're going to add them together. So let's have a look. XMM0 just has 20 in it. Execute the next line. Well, it's added the 50 directly from memory to XMM0, and then it's going to write that back out to the memory. And it does this each time. So even though it's identified it can use an extension to do the floating point calculations, it's not doing anything in parallel. And this is because we're running in debug mode, and as before, debug mode to the programmer needs to behave how the programmer expected it to behave. 
So even though we've specified we can use these extension sets, it's not using them properly because as the programmer steps through this loop, he expects to step through it 16,384 times. So I guess the next question to naturally ask is, well, why is it chosen to use an extension at all? Well, typically because these extensions are dedicated floating point processing systems. They are fast in their own right, and they're potentially faster than the standard floating point processing capabilities supplied by the ALU. And so the compiler is aware, well, let's use the fastest resources we can even though we're not going to fully exploit their capabilities. So what I need to do now is compile this in release mode and see what decisions the compiler makes then. So again, set to release mode, set a breakpoint, and we'll have a look at the disassembly. Well, this looks a little better. So here we see uh, the expression, and underneath we're moving some data around into these YMM0. Now don't forget, these YMM registers are the ones down here. They're twice as big as these XMM0 registers. So let's see what happens when I execute this line. Brilliant. What we see are our floating point hexadecimal values being loaded in uh, into different locations within this YMM register. We've effectively loaded in eight 32-bit floating point values into this single register. I then now add to that register and all of the values changed in one single instruction. We simultaneously performed eight 32-bit floating point additions. And we can see the values in the register when I put my cursor over it. Now, yet again, the compiler has done something else. It's also unrolled this sequence of calculations. So we've not left the loop yet, but it's decided that it would be more efficient to do multiple numbers of these additions before jumping back round in the loop again. And this is for the same reasons outlined before. Once you get these extensions up and running, you really want them to run as fast as possible. You don't want anything to interrupt them, and you don't want them to stall. It's important when you're working with code at this level that you think about data locality. We know that in our CPU, we have registers. We've just seen them. We've seen the XMM registers, and we've got the YMM registers. Of course, data needs to be loaded into these registers and the CPU will attempt to get that from its cache. Now, its cache could be split into several different layers, but cache is very fast. So when it's trying to access data, the first thing it'll do is check is the data it wants in its cache. Cache also sits on the CPU. If the data it's looking for isn't in the cache, that's known as a cache miss. And you'll remember all of this from Computer Science 101. If we miss the cache, we've then got to go and look in RAM. Now, it's not as common on systems today, but it's very possible that the memory you're trying to load into the registers isn't even in RAM. It could exist in a page file on your hard drive. So if the CPU looks for data in cache and misses, that's a cache miss. It could look for a particular page in RAM, that's known as a page fault. In which case it then goes to see, does the page exist in some virtual memory on the hard disk drive? So this is a really important thing to think about when you're starting to write code at this very low level. How close is the data to my CPU? If we wanted to extract something from cache, we might be looking at, I'm picking numbers out of thin air here just to prove a point, but maybe something like 10, uh, one to 10 clock cycles. If it isn't in the cache, well then it's got to go and find it in the RAM via the cache. And that could easily be 10 to 100 clock cycles, if not 1,000 clock cycles, maybe. But certainly, getting data from a hard drive into a register, that's going to be in the millions of clock cycles. So what we want to make sure is that the data we're working with is as close to the CPU as possible. Therefore, we're not stalling any of the instructions that we're trying to execute. Keeping your programs optimized for cache is actually quite a complicated process in its own right. I would say don't worry about it unless you have to. And with modern computer systems with abundance of RAM, uh, it's not very often now that you see things dipping to the hard drive. So things are getting better. This is why it's good to have lots of RAM. It always makes me laugh a bit when you think about just how primitive this really is. So if you've got to go and find something, your CPU's blazing along here at multiple gigahertz, and then suddenly it goes, oops, I need this location from memory, and that memory happens to be on a hard drive. You've literally got to wait for a motor to spin up on your hard disk and physically move a read head to the right location. In, in terms of the processor's timing, this is hundreds of millennia uh, of waiting just for that bit of data to arrive. But as I say, less of a problem these days.
And that's one of the reasons why the compiler unrolls things where it can. Yes, it generates more code, it does mean your executable is bigger, but it's far more effective at just pulling in the data because data tends to move around in groups. You don't just read one byte from the hard drive, you'll read in a, a section of bytes and it's usually typical that you access bytes in a sequential order. And that's certainly implied by the nature of our program. It's very simple, we're just looping through these elements of an array. So rather than having to deal with the loop every single time it's done an addition, it's worked out it's much faster just to try and do as many operations as we can. Something else to take away from this is actually looking at the assembly language, well it's a nightmare isn't it? And you do need to have quite a degree of skill and patience and well probably a little bit of insanity too to uh, actively program in this form, uh, certainly on a desktop computer. Simply put, it's not very readable. Even though we can quite happily understand what it's doing, trying to reverse engineer all of these offsets in different registers is quite a challenge. But now I want to demonstrate the problem. Up until this point, the compiler has been able to easily assume what our intentions are. We're just adding two arrays together. What if we add in a degree of unpredictability. Well to do this I'm going to specify that array 1 is primed with some random numbers. I'm not bothered about the quality of that random number, it's just something different. And what if I want to change the nature of our expression from just being simply add the arrays together to mostly add the arrays together unless the value of one of the arrays happens to be 23. In which case I don't want to perform the addition, I just want to write the value 23 into our target array. Totally pointless program, but it does demonstrate a point. Let's compile this and have a look at the disassembly. And up here we see the start of the for loop, fine, it's priming some information ready for us to use. And down here we see the C++ code handling that conditional expression. And rather disappointingly, the first thing that we can notice is it's gone back to using these 128-bit registers. It's not using the new 256-bit registers, so that's already a warning sign that it's not going to be doing things as optimally as it can. If we step through the code a little bit, uh, we can see it's also only changing one value of these registers at a time. So we're not even using the parallel processing capabilities of these fantastically wide registers. The compiler has completely failed to understand how to solve this problem using the technologies it's got available to it. But it knows it must solve the problem, and so it's resorted to just doing things element by element. Even though it's using these faster processing capabilities of the ALU, it's not really using them uh, in the parallel form like it managed to do before. And so it is in situations like this where we might need to start writing code using intrinsic functions ourselves. The compiler just isn't aware of the bigger picture. It doesn't know how to solve this problem. And it might do in the future, compiler technology is getting much, much better. And I, I really do believe one day we'll be able to have compilers which can solve these sort of things by doing a really thorough analysis of the code. But right now, uh, certainly for this Visual Studio compiler, uh, it can't do it. I've not tried it using the other compilers. Maybe they can in certain situations. But on the whole, this is too challenging a problem for the compiler to understand how to optimize and use all of its available features appropriately. So it's time to do it by hand. In the Fractal video I created different functions to handle different levels of sort of hand tuning the optimization. But the reference function was this one, create fractal basic. And it took in a pixel coordinate on the screen that represented the top left of where we wanted to draw and we took in the bottom right of where we wanted to draw so that was always set to the full screen. But then we also looked at the fractal space. So this was the uh, top left and bottom right of the zoomed in rectangular region of the fractal that we wanted to map to the whole screen. And we passed in the number of, well the maximum number of iterations it's allowed to go up to. And essentially we worked out two values, x scale and y scale, which tell us how much fractal space is represented by one screen pixel. Then we went ahead and iterated through all of the pixels on the screen and calculated the Mandelbrot equation using uh, the complex number type. Now don't let this suddenly alienate you, we're not going to talk about fractals. Particularly if you've not watched that video, it's not entirely relevant. But what I chose to do was to turn this set of maths uh, into uh, the intrinsic form. 
For each stage of that video, we looked at a different type of representation of the same thing. So we created a second function called create fractal no complex under the assumption that the complex component of the standard library wasn't very well optimized. It turned out that wasn't the case. And there were a few comments, you know, what was the point in doing that at all? Well, the point was to break it out into the simplest form possible, because that's the first step when we want to start trying to write things in assembly language, or in, in our case, uh, intrinsic functions. So this performs exactly the same set of calculations as this basic function up here, uh, but it does it with the most minimal required operations. And it's nice because everything is explicitly defined as being multiplies, additions, subtractions, so there's no divisions in this. With that simplified form, we can start to build up the intrinsic equivalent. Rather oddly, I'll be doing some of this out of order, uh, simply because the narrative is better. But the principle is quite similar. We're still going to iterate through all of the visible pixels. But the first thing to note is in the x direction, we're going to be increasing by 4. Now, there were some additional comments about would it be more optimal to do this in the y-axis or the x-axis. For this particular application, and this is just to satisfy those people that asked, it doesn't really matter because I'm not ever reading anything from the memory. Uh, this is purely a data generative approach. So there might be some very minor gains, but on the whole, it really isn't a problem. So why are we doing uh, x plus equals 4? Well, the first thing is, I know I'm going to be using AVX2, which gives me a 256-bit register, into which I can fit four 64-bit doubles. And that was important because we needed that precision uh, in order to go deeper into the fractal. So I'm going to always work with four pixels simultaneously. So if I've got my entire fractal image at any given location, I'm always processing four pixels. So on the next iteration, I'm processing these four and so forth, because my goal is to process all four pixels in parallel. Now you might be quite right to ask, well, is this not something the compiler can just sort out for us? Well, not really. As I've just demonstrated, the algorithm isn't that simple. There's conditions in there, and we'll see actually that branching and conditions is the real problem when it comes to doing intrinsic calculations like this. Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to be doing things slightly out of order. So the first bit I'm going to attack is the while loop component. This is the bit that just repeatedly performs calculations until either uh, it's resolved as a fractal or we've hit the maximum number of iterations we're allowing because it could just go on and on and on forever. So I might just keep this down here as a quick reference. I'll worry about the loop in a moment. Let's first handle this component to try and keep things clear for this video, I'm going to be bringing in little comment examples like this. And I'll also provide some source code as well for you to look at, uh, because I've, I've gone to town on trying to develop the comments in such a way that uh, makes a good uh, follow along guide for this video. But that was the uh, standard complex form that we're trying to resolve. And for the second approach, we broke it down into the most minimal mathematics form. I've called that the manual form in this case. And so it is these expressions that we want to try and implement using uh, intrinsic functions. First things first, though, we're going to need some registers. Before we can do anything with intrinsic functions, we need to actually include the header file. In this case, it's imintrin.h. And it does seem to be it's reasonably cross-platform. But as soon as we start delving into the world of intrinsics, you can't assume anything. And, and in good intrinsic code, the first thing you should do is test your host system. Does it actually have the capabilities uh, to use these intrinsic functions? It may not have AVX2, in which case you need to provide a fallback or some other solution, or just notify the user to buy a new processor. There are also slight differences between the Linux and Windows uh, versions of the Imtrin library. Uh, that fortunately, though, they're much better than they used to be, and I've found that the code was, on the whole, entirely compatible across both operating systems, with a minor change, and we'll see that uh, at the end. So looking at this bit of code already, I can see I'm going to need registers to hold the real component of Z, the imaginary component of Z, the real component of C, and imaginary of C, and I'm also going to need these A and Bs as well. So let's pull those in. To define something as being of these 256-bit types, we use the double underscore M256D type. Yes, everything's going to get a bit of a mouthful here. And when I'm working with intrinsics, I like to prefix them with an underscore because it just sends that little mental flag to me that, hang on, these are not normal. There's something a bit strange going on here. So we know that we needed Z real. We know we're going to need 
Z imaginary. We know we're going to need C real. Not serial, C real. And we know we're going to need C imaginary. And we know also we're going to need A and B. So this type is saying, please use these 256-bit registers and we're going to store doubles in them. Looking back at the code, I can see here I've got ZR squared and ZI squared. I know that I need those elsewhere later on, so it might be useful to just store those as well. So I'll put in a ZR squared and a ZI squared. It might be tempting to think, let's just create as many registers as we possibly can, but it's probably better practice to use as few as you possibly can to simply maintain that data locality we were talking about earlier. We want to ensure that everything can actually reside in the processor, and we also know that there is a limited number of these special registers available. So yes, we can declare as many as we like, but at any one time, I think it's only eight can be resident in the CPU registers. The rest will go out to cache, and of course, then you've got the potential for cache misses. So that's why I would recommend just only uh, use what you need to use. Don't be too trigger happy at creating special registers. So let's do our first instruction. Let's actually calculate uh, ZR times ZR. And yes, it's going to be a copy and paste video this because these instructions are actually quite simple. So here's ZR squared equals ZR times ZR. The intrinsic instruction we're going to use is this mouthful here, underscore MM256. So we're saying let's use the 256-bit registers. I want to perform a multiply uh, between these two registers, and I'm going to do them in parallel for all of them, and they are of type double. In fact, if I put my cursor over it, IntelliSense is quite happily telling me what's really going on here. It says here, performs a SIMD multiply of the four packed double precision floating point values from the first operand to the second operand and stores it in the destination. That's precisely what we want. So the two operands I'm going to provide are just simply ZR and ZR. I want to square them and I'm putting them in this ZR squared register. So that's done that to four values simultaneously. And this is where I think people will start to think, oh, it's quite simple, this intrinsic stuff. And the nice part is, yes, it is on the whole. So I can move along quite quickly. I also now have ZI squared, exactly the same. The next part to look at is this. We're subtracting ZI squared from ZR squared. And the instructions look very familiar already. I'm storing this into our temporary value A, and instead of mull, it's subtract this time. It really is that simple. On the right here, I'm trying to sort of express what we have calculated in, in various forms, just to try and keep things as obvious as possible. When you're working with intrinsics or assembly language, that's one of those rare times where comments really do help keep things clear. Because we'll see later on, when we start doing the branching and the conditional stuff, it can become quite a mind. The next instruction to think about is this addition of C real to what we've just calculated. So we, fortunately we've stored that in A already, so all I need to do is add C real to A. So in this case I've called the addition function and added C real to A. So this has performed all of these calculations to four values simultaneously. We've now completed this line, so let's calculate a value for B. Z real times Z imaginary times two plus C imaginary. Well, the first part should be quite obvious now. But the second part, well, this is going to introduce something new. We've got a constant here. What is a constant in a parallel vector? So our aim here is to calculate this expression, b times 2 plus ci. But that 2 needs to be represented in a parallel form. Now I've adopted this notation to say we've got four uh, doubles of value 2 in one of our vectors. So how do we go about setting that up? Well, the simplest way is to have a register predefined with the values you want. So I'm going to call this register 2. And I need to initialize it appropriately with the four two values. And to do that, I can use this intrinsic function uh, called set one parallel double again. And so this means you're going to provide one argument and it will set all of the vector elements to that one argument. So now my two contains two, 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 two. With that in mind, I can now multiply B and then add C imaginary to it. But this is a multiply add, and that's quite a unique thing. We could go and do it by hand like we did up here, call multiply and call add, but it's always worth checking the documentation for what intrinsics are available to you because the developers of the extension set hardware realized, well, hang on, it's all very well having this parallel ability, but what people really want 
is. And so these extensions also provide lots of additional functions which will save significant numbers of clock cycles trying to calculate. And they have provided one which will multiply and add simultaneously. It's called floating point multiply add parallel doubles. So we provide in the B our register filled with twos and CI and it will go and calculate all of that in one hit. Multiply accumulates like this are quite an important thing in digital signal processing, so it's no wonder uh, that it's provided here as an intrinsic function. One of the features of intrinsic functions could be that if the extension didn't have an FM add instruction, it could go away and synthesize it using the instructions that are available on that particular piece of hardware. And that's why these functions are a little more friendlier to use than writing directly in the assembly language itself. So calculating this component was much simpler. We've now just got this very simple assignment. There's nothing special to do here, we simply assign them. Looking back at our little reference implementation, we must always remind ourselves that this is happening per element. But now we're starting to do things in groups of four elements at a time. We've calculated the complex number component of this algorithm. And if we were to think of this as a single element, we would then increase the number of iterations and then perform this condition. Conditions are a problem for intrinsics. As we saw at the start of this video, the compiler simply can't work out how to solve this problem. But fortunately, the intrinsic functions work in such a way that we can emulate conditions without disrupting the flow of data through the processor. But it does mean you have to think a little bit differently. This is no longer n++ because it's not just a single element we're operating on. Some of them will be n++ and some of them we don't want to increase n at all. And so one of those elements might need an increment but the others don't. How do we handle that kind of situation? It isn't possible to simply switch off an element because it follows the SIMD paradigm we talked about earlier. All of the elements get the same operation every single time. But since we can't switch off a particular element, we can do the next best thing. We can mask it out. We can make it so the operation is still performed on it, but ultimately it doesn't write anything out to the memory. The data doesn't get changed. And that's what makes conditions and branching a little bit tricky. We're going to have to start thinking in terms of masks. And to think in terms of masks, you're going to need to be familiar with bitwise operations. And if you're not familiar with bitwise operations, then I have a video all about them. It's the first part of the NES emulator series. That entire video is dedicated to nothing but bitwise operations. So let's start thinking about how we handle this while loop. As before, I've written out what is the purest form and what was the reduced form, so we know what components to calculate. So to begin with, we've got some simple calculations to perform. Well, we know how to do those now. We can see we've got ZR squared plus ZI squared. Fortunately, we have the ZR squared and ZI squared already calculated, so we can reuse those. Let's do that. In this case, they're just added together. And what we're checking for are which elements of our newly created A vector containing the result of this calculation are less than 4. Well, we can see we've got another constant here, it's 4. And so, as before, I'm going to create a special register just to hold that constant. The next step is to actually evaluate this inequality. And there are intrinsic functions to do that, and the output of these functions are what are known as a mask, and we can use these masks to effectively, uh, well, emulate the switching on and off of individual vector elements. I need to store my mask somewhere, so I'm going to create another register called mask1, and I'm creating it of the same type of, as the double, because I'm going to be comparing doubles, and that's just the way intrinsics work, and we'll see there may be a little bit of casting involved later on to sort all this out, but uh, fundamentally if we're comparing two doubles in a 256D register, then our mask will also be a 256D type. And so now let's go through the equality. So in its simplest form, what I'm going to calculate now is our mask1 is going to be the equivalent of if A is less than 4. And if we expand that out, and I, I apologise for doing this in code and not in slides, it's just it, it's simpler this way. If we expand that out, what we're going to actually check are in the elements locations, if, if this element is less than 4, if this element is less than 4, if this element is less than 4, and if this element is less than 4. We're going to do all of this in parallel. The result of a condition like this yields what's known as a mask. And for all of the elements that are true as a result of this condition, all of the bits, in this case all 64 bits, will be set to 1. 
If it's false, all 64 bits are set to zero. Now, I've put in three dots here because I'm not typing out that many bits. So you don't just get a true or a false, you don't get a single zero or one, you get the entire element's bit content set to one or zero, depending on the result of the condition. And this is very useful. And I think just to reduce the typing even further, uh, I'm going to stick with this notation now to show exactly the same thing. Uh, all of these elements have a bit set to one and all of these elements have a bit set to zero. And I will now go and use the intrinsic function uh, compare to go and produce this mask register for me. So it's compare parallel double our a value with four and what I'm comparing is less than. So this is compare less than. And this will have populated my mask with the appropriate ones and zeros in the corresponding element locations. So now we've generated a mask for this part of our condition, we now need to look at a mask for this part of our condition. And things are a little bit different on this side. N and iterations are integer types, they're not doubles. And in fact, they are 64-bit integer types. And when you want to work with intrinsic functions with 64-bit integers, you use the underscore underscore M256I type. And so far, I know I need one that represents n, one that represents the iterations, and I'm going to create another mask which is working with integers. Iterations here is the constant value we pass in with the function. So I'll need to expand that out. And we have a, a similar uh, way of doing that with a constant. Uh, we call this set1 function again, as you can see we did it for 2 and 4, uh, but this time we're specifying please use a 64-bit integer. Some of these suffixes to the functions can be a little bit cryptic, uh, but I'll, I'll show you a documentation page for the intrinsics later on. You actually see it's, they're documented quite well. But this is going to take our number of iterations and expand it across all four elements of our 64-bit integer vector register. It's important that this second mask is of type 256i, because as before, when we were comparing doubles, we ended up with a double mask. We're now comparing integers, we're going to end up with an integer mask. So even though it makes little sense when all of your bits are 0 or 1 to be a double or an integer, uh, that's just how it is. For the second part of our while condition, we're checking if n is less than iterations. Now, you start getting into some of the quirks of the language here. Uh, for my particular install of the intrinsics header, I don't have a less than comparison function for integers. What I do have is a greater than. So I can do exactly the same thing here, I just need to flip these around. Is iterations greater than n? And I want to populate my mass 2 with the appropriate result. The intrinsic function I'm going to use in this case is compare greater than integer 64 types. So whereas before we could specify as an argument which particular inequality we wanted, we can't do that here. Our integer types have a specific function for comparison. So now I have two registers filled with nothing but zeros and ones in the corresponding locations. Our condition ands these together, and I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to take my m2, and I'm going to logically and m2 with m1, which will perform this combined condition. And I'm just going to stick with the comments here because it can help us understand what we're doing. Uh, if that's the contents of my m2 register, and of course these are made up, these numbers, but that could be the contents of it, and that's the contents of my m1 register, bitwise logically adding them together produces the result you might expect. So here we've got false and true, and the result of course is false. And here we've got true and false is equal to false. But here we've got true and true, so our result is equal to true. So we've managed to reduce our number of active elements in this large register, down to just the one that satisfies both parts of this condition. And to perform the logic and, I'm going to use this compiler intrinsic function. And this wants to perform a comparison between two 256-bit integer registers. Now, one of my registers happens to be of type double. So I can use this intrinsic function, which is cast our parallel double vector to a single single register of 256 bits wide, it's like a 256-bit integer almost. Fortunately, this cast doesn't cost anything. It's there purely to keep the compiler happy. And I'm glad it exists because it does make you think about the uh, domains of the registers that you're using. But of course, both of these registers are just 256 bit long filled with zeros and ones. There's nothing stopping you doing a logic and. The fact that some of these zeros and ones may represent other number types doesn't matter. So this cast doesn't cost anything to do, but it does keep your code sane. So after all of this, this means in our mask2, we've got just the active elements that satisfy that condition.
So if this condition is true, then we are effectively incrementing our n in those locations. So now we want to check that wherever these locations are equal to all ones, that's where we want to increment our n for that pixel of the fractal. To perform this increment, I'm going to add another integer type variable, which is just going to be a temporary c. And I'm going to use c to store a numeric integer 1 in the correct location of our vector. And I'll do that by taking a predefined constant vector that stores nothing but integer 1s, 64-bit integer 1s in this case, and I'm going to AND it with our mask register up here. And just to follow through with the style of the comments, our Cs are filled with genuine numeric integer 1. So in this case it's all zeros, but we've got a 1 in the least significant bit for that element. If I logic AND that with the mask that we've calculated, I then end up with a register that contains mostly zeros, but it contains a numeric 1 in the locations where we need it. This of course implies that I need a constant 1 somewhere in my code. And so just as before, I'm going to use the same function to pad out all of the elements of this register with an integer 1. Now I can perform the increment for the correct element of the vector. And that's quite simply a case now of adding n to c, which contains the 1s in the right location. Because if it's got zeros in them, of course that value isn't going to change. We can't add 0 to it and expect it to change, but we can increment it by adding 1 appropriately. And just to pad out the comments again, so you can download this source code, uh, I've sort of visually described what's going on here. Our n could contain uh, various numbers of iterations, depending on how that pixel has been calculated. Our c contains uh, 1 in those locations that need to be incremented. Uh, and n, of course, is just n plus c after that. So we only see the increment in the pixels that need to be incremented. Looking at our loop, we use the condition to stop our while loop when we're working with things element by element. When we're working in groups of four elements at a time, we don't want to stop until all four have satisfied that condition. We've arranged it in such a way with masks that even though elements that may have satisfied that condition still get computed, they can't physically change because we never allow the values to get written out. We don't allow any further incrementing. And what we want to avoid is a situation where we terminate our loop early simply because one of the elements has satisfied the condition. Fortunately, intrinsic functions are there to help us again. Instead of using a while loop in this program, I've chosen to use go to repeat. And so I'll stick a repeat label at the top. I don't think there's anything wrong with using go to and labels when fundamentally your program is an assembly language program. After all, goto is a fairly fundamental assembly language instruction. So we only want to go to repeat, i.e. emulate our while loop, when this condition is true for any one of the elements. We know which elements in our vector are active because the mask in that corresponding location will be set to all ones. If any of them are active, they're still processing. We still need to keep looping. It would be very useful if there was a function that could reduce our 256-bit register into a simpler form that we can evaluate. And fortunately, there is. We can use the intrinsic function move mask parallel double. Now, our mask2 was of type integer, so I'm casting it again. Again, doesn't cost anything. And this move mask function will create a single integer value where the bits in that integer value are extracted from the most significant bits of the masks of the individual elements of the vector. Effectively, they're the sign bits of the double values that are being used. And so in this example, we've got one active element. When we combine all of these serially into a single integer, that has the value two. Well, that's greater than zero because zero would be all of these set to zero. And if it is zero, then we know there's no further computation required for that group of four pixels. So we don't have to go to repeat. We now have an extension set vector n that contains the number of iterations for that pixel, and that is of course what goes on to be visualized. But it's difficult for our visualization code to work with this funky type of m256i. Uh, instead, I'd rather they just be standard integers in a standard integer array for visualization. Therefore, I'll unpack our complicated vector type into four integers. And for Windows, uh, this is how you do it. You take your mm256i type, and you can extract an individual 64-bit integer just by accessing it like an array. 
I'm not interested in 64-bit integers in this case. I, d I know that uh, it's not going to have gone beyond 4 billion iterations because uh, my computer would have melted. So I'm quite happy with uh, casting it to an integer in this case, performing a truncation. That's completely satisfactory for me. Uh, there were a few comments raised on the GitHub about people getting the fractal code to compile. Uh, there is a slight difference on Linux platforms, so I'll just include that here for completeness. Uh, you don't do it this way, you just simply uh, access the uh, register directly like an array. There's only one thing to do, and compared to everything we've done so far, it's very, very simple. Uh, of course, these computations need to know where they are in fractal space. At the moment, they're just calculating something, but we've not actually told them where they are. We've not initialized uh, any of our complex number vector registers. When I wrote this code originally, I chose to increment along the x-axis, so my registers contain groups of four pixels aligned horizontally. Therefore, I only need to concern myself with using vector registers along the x-axis. The y-axis can remain exactly the same as it did before. So I'm just going to pull in the code from the previous function. None of that's going to change. We don't need to use vector extensions to compute it. But I do need something for the x-axis. And I'm going to add in uh, a bunch of additional registers just to handle uh, x-axis calculations. The x-scale value here, I want to be a constant. And don't forget, this represents the amount of fractal space occupied by a single pixel. The x jump register I want to populate with how far in fractal space do I move when I go from one cluster of four pixels to the next cluster of four pixels. Well of course that's just simply four times the scale. So going back to this original diagram let's assume this location in the x-axis is 5.0 and I know that per pixel in fractal space I'm going 0.1 per pixel. So this eventually becomes 5.0, 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3. I then jump knowing that this location here is 5.4. So to handle that, I'm going to fill my XPOS offsets register with the 0.1 equivalent in this case, uh, depending on what the scale is. And we're going to use a new intrinsic function here, which is set parallel double. It's not set one parallel double. This allows you to set the four values explicitly. So I'm just setting those to zero, one, two, and three. And then I use the intrinsic function multiply to multiply these values by our scale. Ultimately, this will give me a vector that contains the expositional offsets of each pixel in that vector in fractal space. It's getting complicated this, isn't it? Using this information and knowing where we are in pixel space, I can populate a final vector containing those pixel positions. And I need to do that in each iteration of my loop. When I'm iterating in the y-axis, I know that my x is at the start of the screen, so I can reset my x position. I'm going to hijack my temporary value a here, set its value to the left-hand side of the fractal space, and then add to that value the x positional offsets. That will give me my final x pos value. The imaginary component of our fractal ci is simply the y location. And the real component is our x location, as calculated. Finally, we've got some initializations to do. This is why I said things would be a little bit out of order. Uh, we just want to initialize a few things to zero. So before we do any calculations, let's make sure our registers contain zero. And there is an intrinsic function called set zero. It does what it says on the tin. So I've zeroed out my z real, zeroed out my z imaginary, and I also want to zero out the number of iterations, our n value that we've been calculating. Uh, I have to use set zero and then some funky integer type at the end. If you ever do want to know what intrinsic functions are available to you, you can simply Google it. But there's a good list on the Microsoft uh, website for this particular compiler. And you can actually use this list to look for other compilers too, because they're, they're quite similar between the different compilers. And it's an extensive list. That's the really beautiful thing about intrinsics. There are loads of them, loads and loads and loads and loads. And it tells you which particular feature set is required in order to use that intrinsic. And so, for example, here is one we've been using quite a bit, mm256 add parallel double. It says it needs uh, AVX, doesn't need AVX2 for that specific one, it tells us which header file contains the definition of that intrinsic and gives us a prototype for the function. In fact, we can click on this 
and it takes us straight to the Intel website. And this is actually a much better resource because it allows you to search for the types of intrinsics that you want. And so it's found specifically that one, gives us a little example of what it does in pseudocode. And that can be quite useful for some of the uh, more esoteric instructions that are available. And so there you have it, potentially the most hardcore video we have had on the One Lone Coder channel ever. Uh, how to calculate the Mandelbrot fractal using uh, intrinsics as part of the AVX2 extension set. It is complicated stuff uh, initially, but it really only gets complicated when it comes to this masking side of things. The rest of it, if you've got simple array operations you want to do, the instructions are quite simple. But it does require you have a slightly intuitive understanding of what your hardware is doing. And that is to be expected. You're going lower level using this stuff. And so you do really need to understand what your hardware is doing and how you can best exploit intrinsic functions to calculate what you need. The compiler can't always do it for you. As usual, I'll provide uh, this code on the GitHub so you can explore it with all of the comments at your leisure. Uh, there isn't a sort of an executable program to provide with this one. It was already done as part of the Fractal video. If you've enjoyed this video, and you know, it's been a pretty tough one, uh, please give me a big thumbs up, have a think about subscribing, come and have a chat on the Discord, and I'll see you next time. And I think next time might be the uh, OLC Beat the Borden Game Jam review video, so a nice community showcase one. Good stuff. Take care, see you later.